those who served during the Korean War, like Mr. Rangel before us, but will honor those who served today on the Cold War's last frontier along the DMZ. I strongly urge all of my colleagues to support this important resolution, and I reserve the balance of my time, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman, gentlewoman from Florida reserves the balance of her time. Gentleman from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I rise in strong support of House Resolution 376, calling for the repatriation of POWs, MIAs, and abductees from the Korean War, and uh, and I'm going to uh, yield to the sponsor of this legislation, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Rangel, himself a Korean War veteran, as our chairman has mentioned, uh, five minutes to open the debate on this issue. Five the minutes to the New York is New York. recognized for five minutes. Without objection. Let me uh, thank so much for the sensitivity and support that the gentle lady from Florida and uh, chairman of this, com this committee uh, for the strong support and the friendship that you've extended uh, not only to me, but to the people that you have felt their pain, even though the hostilities is over. And the courtesy that uh, Ranking Member Berman has given in allowing me uh, to open the discussion on this important debate. As most of you know, in 1950, the communist North Koreans invaded the South Korea crossing a line that Russia and the United States had settled in what they call the 38th parallel. Well, you can separate a geographic area, but you cannot separate a people that have the same background, the same language, and the same culture. Nor can you engage into a war and to insist that you are not going to abide by the international obligations that even in those type of hostilities most nations abide by. We've had close to two million American soldiers, men and women, uh, in Korea with allies and friends in the United Nations to stop this hostile communist unwarranted takeover of South Korea. In that war, over 50,000 Americans was killed, double that number was wounded, and we had thousands of people that were just taken as prisoners of war, or they were missing in action. There was a time that the regime in North Korea was helping the State Department and the United States in finding where these bodies are located, and with some success. When you lose a loved one, at some point in time, it has to come to closure. And when you know that the people could have these bodies and for evil intent not respond to the basic human needs of those who suffered so much, it seems to me that this Congress and, and, and the executive branch should insist that a part of our priorities in dealing with North Korea is that they allow and cooperate with us in finding the remains of those people who fought for this great country and because their families and their friends have suffered so much pain. As it relates to the South Koreans, they even sacrificed more lives. They were not hostile. They were not bothering anybody when this hostility came to such an extent that the whole world almost condemned it. And of course, the 2nd Infantry Division that I served in in 1950 were the first to leave the United States to face the enemy and joined with our allies who were able to drive them to the North Korean border with China. As most of you know, the Chinese entered with hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of volunteers, and we found that many lives were lost. In the course of this, South Koreans that were not in North Korea, they were in the northern part of their country. South Koreans that were captured, South Koreans that fought, South Koreans that were professors, workmen and whatnot, were captured, held hostage, 
and the worst of all, separated from their families and friends. As I said, you can politically separate a country. You can draw an imaginary line on the map. But the truth of the matter is that the South Koreans have suffered long enough. They have really become our friends. They have become the, 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 the sentinel of democracy in this part of the world. They have become one of our strongest trading partners. And we never have to ask them for help. They're always there. When Korea's in trouble, we will be there for them. When America's in trouble, we don't have to call on South Korea. And so I want to thank the committee members and this Congress and this nation, not to forget our friends and especially not to forget those who still mourn those who gave up their lives for their great countries, both South Korea and for the United States of America. And we hope that through this effort, the State Department will resume looking for the Americans who put themselves in hard way and their families have no knowledge where they are. And we'd like to thank Ms. Lee and all of the people who have come here to convince us that these families have to be reunited and America will see that it is done. Thank you. I yield my time back and I thank you for the courtesy. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks and Without have them objection. placed in the record. Thank you. And I, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from California yields back. The gentlewoman from Florida. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And for our, our closing speaker, I'm pleased to recognize uh, uh, for such time as he may consume uh, my good friend from California, Mr. Royce, who's the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Terrorism, Nonproliferation and Trade, and a co-sponsor of this important resolution. The gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of this resolution, and several of our colleagues, Sam Johnson, Howard Coble, John Conyers, and its author, Charlie Rangel, bravely fought in this war and deserve our recognition tonight, even if he hasn't had a bad day since. Uh, they deserve our recognition. And Mr. Speaker, the Korean War, as we know, is often called the Forgotten War. But those who fought it and our South Korean allies haven't forgotten this war. And by moving this legislation forward tonight, we're signaling that the House has not forgotten this war. And as much as anything, I believe this resolution demonstrates the shared commitment, the shared sacrifice that serves as the foundation of that U.S.-South Korea alliance. We've all seen a lot change in those six decades since our colleagues fought in that war. But with U.S. support, South Korea has transformed into a modern leading economy in the world today. But you still go north of that 38th parallel. I've been north of that 38th parallel. And they still live literally in darkness. It's been more than 60 years since the start of the Korean War. And after all that time, our Department of Defense lists more than 8,000 American servicemen as POWs who are missing in action. The number of South Koreans is estimated to be many times that because as many as 100,000 South Koreans were forcibly conscripted into the North Korean army. For our veterans and for their families, it is well past time for a full accounting, which is what this resolution calls for. Indeed, as this resolution states, there are still South Korean prisoners of war and civilian abductees from the Korean War who are still alive in, in North Korea and want to be repatriated back to the South. For the sake of those impacted, I urge passage of this resolution and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Florida. I yield back the balance of our time. Thank you so much. The gentlewoman sir. from Florida yields back. The question is, Will the House suspend the rules and agree to House Resolution 376 as amended? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The resolution is agreed to. And without objection, the motion is 
reconsidered is laid on the table. For Is actually yielded out to Whitfield and you, and then you can do it. Mr. Speaker, for what purpose is the gentleman from California reckon? Uh, Mr. Recognition? Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass House Resolution 306 as amended. The clerk, the clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Resolution 306, Resolution urging the Republic of Turkey to safeguard its Christian heritage and to return confiscated church properties. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and, ex and include at that time extraneous material on this bill. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from California, Mr. Royce, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Berman, each will. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. I rise to oppose the right of resolution. Time in opposition to the resolution. Does the gentleman from California favor the motion? Uh, it Does the other gentleman from California favor the motion? I do. On that basis, and, and, the gentleman from Kentucky will control 20 minutes in opposition. May I, may I ask, Mr. Speaker, then unanimous consent to yield half of my time to the gentleman from California, Mr. Berman, and that he may be able to control that time? Without objection, the gentleman from California is recognized. Then I'll yield myself such time as I might consume, Mr. Speaker. Uh, let me begin by by quoting Thomas Jefferson. He said, in our early struggles for liberty, religious freedom could not fail to become a primary object. Jefferson was a very smart man, and he understood that the core foundation of democracy relied on individual differences and opinions without fear of intimidation. And this concept is one that we as Americans have benefited from since our founding. Religious freedom has played an integral part of our continued success as a country. Sadly, very sadly, this is a freedom that so many countries like Turkey still tr struggle to realize. And today we're considering this House Resolution 306, which I authored with ranking member Howard Berman, urging the Republic of Turkey to safeguard its Christian heritage and return confiscated church properties to their rightful owners. Unfortunately, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom has had to put Turkey on its watch list for three straight years now. And the Commission reports that the Turkish government's formal long-standing efforts to control religion by imposing suffocating regulations and by denying full legal status to religious institutions results in serious religious freedoms violations. The government has failed to take decisive action to correct the climate of impunity against religious minorities and to make the necessary institutional reforms to reverse these conditions. Now those are the words of the Commission itself on this subject. Religious tolerance has long been a problem for Turkey. Turkey has yet to rem remedy the desecration of religious properties of over two million Armenians and Greeks and Assyrians and Syriacs over the last 100 years. Until these obligations are fulfilled, religious freedom will remain elusive and frankly, relations with the United States will suffer. 
Prime Minister Erdogan recently issued a decree to return confiscated church property taken after 1936, but the majority of confiscated religious properties, of course, were taken prior to 1936. We are sending a signal, signal today that Turkey should reassess the cutoff date, and I, I would suggest that outside pressure and actions like we're taking here today, and reports like the Religious Commission have helped with what progress we have seen to date. The United States has a vested interest to advance religious freedom. Turkey's claims to be a secular country is not enough when dealing with the day-to-day -day discriminatory harassment that religious minorities face there. For actions, speak louder than words. There are very few religious minorities in Turkey. These are men and women struggling to practice their faith. They need added protection. So this resolution urges Turkey to end all forms of, dis of religious discrimination, to allow rightful church properties to, or you know, to organize and train and teach and practice religious activities without hindrance or restriction, and to return church properties and relics to its rightful owners, whether that be places of worship or monasteries or schools or hospitals or holy sites or other artifacts. And lastly, to allow religious minority groups to own religious properties so that they can preserve and reconstruct and repair religious properties as they see fit. Religious freedom is a fundamental human right, so I urge the passage of this House Resolution 306 urging the Republic of Turkey to safeguard its Christian heritage and return confiscated church properties. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Kentucky. I've read uh, H. Res. Resolution 306, and certainly there's nothing in the language of this resolution that very many people would oppose. Uh, it basically says that it is the sense of the House of Representatives that the Secretary of State in all official contacts with Turkish leaders and other Turkish offici officials should emphasize that Turkey should end all forms of religious discriminations, and then it goes on from there. Now, this resolution, in a way, reminds me of asking someone, do they still beat their children? Because whatever they answer, they're going to be uh, condemned. And the mere fact that the resolution is being introduced would leave an objective observer with the opinion that religious freedom is being systematically denied in Turkey. So let's just look at a few of the facts. On uh, September 13, 2011, during a briefing on the release of U.S. Department of State International Religious Freedom Report, Secretary Clinton praised Turkey's recent steps in an enhancing religious freedom. We've also seen Turkey take serious steps to improve the climate for religious tolerance. The Turkish government issued a decree in August that invited non-Muslims to reclaim churches and synagogues that were confiscated 75 years ago. And this was the language of uh, Secretary Clinton. I applaud Prime Minister Erdogan's very important commitment to doing so. And in its 13th annual report on international religious freedom, the U.S. Department of State also underscored Turkey's recent efforts. During the reporting period, the government took steps to improve religious freedom. Notably, the government permitted religious services to be held annually in historic Christian sites that had been turned into state museums after decades of disuse. These positive statements have shown that Turkey has good intentions in pursuing uh, religious freedom. And I might say that last year, the Turkish Prime Minister issued a circular that emphasized the right of all Turkish people, Muslim and non-Muslim, to enjoy their religious cultures and identities. Prime Minister Erdogan has urged all government institutions to act in accordance with this message. So I think it's quite clear that while this resolution has no binding legal effect, has no authority over Turkey whatsoever, it's, we can see that Turkey 
is taking specific steps to ensure religious freedom in Turkey, and they're doing so uh, without any prodding from the U.S. So at this time, I would uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Berman. <clears throat> yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of HRES 306 and yield initially three minutes to uh, a leader in this effort for a very long time, uh, my colleague and neighbor from California, Mr. Gen Schiff. The gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman uh, from California for yielding and for his leadership on this important issue. From the spring of 1915 and continuing for the next eight years, the forces of the Ottoman Empire, police and military, engaged in a genocide of the Armenian people living within the borders of their dying empire. When it was over, more than 1.5 million men, women, and children were killed in the first genocide of the 20th century. They were beaten, shot, marched to their deaths through scorching deserts or across frigid mountains, and left where they fell. Families and entire communities were destroyed as the Ottomans did everything in their power to make a people disappear. But the physical near annihilation of the Armenian people was not enough to satisfy the Turks' desire to wreak vengeance on Armenia, which was the first nation in the world to adopt Christianity as its official religion in AD 301. Their campaign against the Armenians was broader and was aimed at destroying not only the Armenian people, but also their history, their culture, and their faith. When Ottoman forces began to massacre their Armenian neighbors 95 years ago, there were nearly 2,000 Armenian churches in what is now Turkey. Fewer than 100 remain standing and fully functioning today. One of the world's oldest Christian communities has, in significant part, disappeared from its ancestral homeland. While the Armenian Genocide stands as a singular event, the persecution of the Armenians has continued, and much of it centers on the Armenian status as a Christian minority in an overwhelmingly Muslim country, where discriminatory laws are used to confiscate church property and prevent free worship. And other Christian communities, especially the Greek Orthodox, have also been the victims of Turkish intolerance. In northern Cyprus, which was invaded by the Turkish army in 1974, churches have been left to rot, cemeteries have been desecrated or fallen into disrepair, and priests are forbidden from accessing the churches they prayed in as children. Earlier this year, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom noted in its 2011 report, quote, the Turkish government continues to impose serious limitations on freedom of religion or belief, thereby threatening the continued vitality and survival of minority religious communities in Turkey. Ours is a nation that has prized freedom of religion. For more than two centuries, we have stood for tolerance of other faiths, and American diplomats, members of Congress, and presidents have consistently pressed other governments to respect and protect their minorities. This resolution is in the finest tradition of advocacy for those whose voices have been silenced. And I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor and to join my colleagues, especially Mr. Royce and Mr. Berman, the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, a friend who has been a leader on these issues throughout his years of service in the House. I urge a yes vote, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from California. Okay. Uh, I'll be. I'll yield some time to the gentleman later on. But you have some time now. So yes. if you would go on on your time, I will yield right. to you later. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Burns. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield myself um, two and a half minutes. The gentleman from California is recognized for two and a half minutes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Christian communities of Turkey, once populous and prosperous, have now for many decades been victims of discrimination. The result has been a drastic decline in the Christian population. Whereas well over two million Christians lived in Anatolia a century ago, Today, there are only a few thousand, less than 1% of Turkey's population. Although Christians clearly constitute no threat to the majority, the various Christian communities remain the victims of unceasing discrimination.
Their churches have been desecrated, their properties confiscated, and they are denied the right to practice their religion as they see fit or train their clergy. Through this resolution, we're asking Turkey rectify this terrible situation. Much of the worst damage to and the confiscation of Christian properties was done in the early decades of the Turkish Republic. But it continues to some extent today. Some three months after the introduction of this resolution in June, Turkish, President, Pri Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan responded with a decree that would return a small percentage of the property confiscated from religious minorities, as well as provide compensation for property that was seized and later sold. This is too little and too late. It doesn't even begin to make up for the years of loss and the damaging impact on the minority communities, but it does appear to be a step in the right direction. We will watch its implementation closely. Meanwhile, the Turkish government must also address the many other forms of discrimination that Christians in Turkey endure. Every church in Turkey suffers petty harassment at a minimum and is forced to apply to central authorities for authorization to do any type of repairs or construction, requests that often linger for months and years without government action. Moreover, Turkey recognizes certain Christian groups as legitimate, but not others. If you belong to one of the unauthorized groups, such as evangelicals, you can't even build a church. This resolution calls on Turkey to make good on all past transgressions and allow true freedom of religion, to achieve the standards of democratic behavior to which it says and to which I believe it aspires. We want Turkey to allow its Christian citizens to worship exactly as they want and to allow them to train their clergy exactly as they want. Uh, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman reserves balance the time. Gentleman from Kentucky. I yield myself uh, four minutes. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for four minutes. I might say that uh, Turkey certainly has been a valuable ally of the United States for many years. As we all know, it is the only Muslim nation in NATO. It has been a vital partner to the United States in the war on terror in both Iraq and in Afghanistan. And just recently, Turkey agreed to host a NATO radar defense system directed toward Iran. Turkey also is becoming an increasing important uh, commercial partner. But I wanted to also point out about three years ago, without any input from the U.S. Congress, the Secretary of State, or anyone else in the federal government, the Directorate of Religious Affairs in Turkey, on his own initiation, had one of his uh, religious scholars of the Muslim faith spend a semester at Wesley Theological Seminary here in Washington, D.C. And during that semester, there was a dialogue between members of the Christian faith and members of the Muslim faith. And during that time, there was not any finger pointing. There was not e any uh, accusing the other side of being uh, mean-spirited or anything else, but it was simply an exchange of ideas. That was at the initiative of the Directorate, Directorate of Religious Affairs in Turkey. I might also point out that in October, the Archbishop of the Armenian Orthodox Church reconsecrated Giorgos, St. Giorgos, an Armenian church near Lake Van in Turkey. That church has recently been renovated. I would also say that in, on November the 11th of 2010, Turkish authorities returned a former orphanage on Princess Island to the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate following a decision uh, by the U European Court of Human Rights. And uh, the attorney representing the Patriarchate declared this marks a first in Europe. Turkey became the first country to implement a decision this should be an example of other countries. So I think it's very clear that Turkey is moving in the right direction. 
they do not need to be condemned in my view. They are a vital uh, ally of the U U.S. And uh, with that, I would uh, yield the balance of my time. I mean, not yield the balance of my time, but I would re reserve the balance okay, of my time. Okay, the gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Um, gentleman from California, Mr. Royce. We'll yield the time. I'll yield uh, two minutes uh, to the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. The gentleman from California is represented for two and a half minutes. Thank you. The adoption of H.R.E.S. 306 would add a powerful voice of the United States Congress to the defense of religious freedom for Christians in present-day Turkey and reinforce the traditional leadership of Congress in defending freedom of faith around the world. I want to identify myself with the comments of uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff, on putting this resolution in context by noting uh, the Armenian genocide and how that sets the stage for everything we're talking about here. HRS 306 is urgently needed to address the destruction of Christian religious heritage as a result of the Turkish government's theft, desecration, and disregard of ancient Christian sites and churches, many of them holding great significance to Christian heritage. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom raises the following alarm in its 2001 report. The Turkish government continues to impose serious limitations on freedom of religion or belief, thereby threatening the continued vitality and survival of minority religious communities in Turkey. Churches in Turkey have been desecrated. The adoption of HRES 306 would support the Christian communities within Turkey who remain vulnerable and are forced to endure restrictions on the right to practice their faith in freedom. For example, and this is just one example, of the over 2,000 Armenian churches which existed in the early 1900s, less than 100 remain standing and fully functioning today. This resolution is supported by the co-chairs of the Armenian, Hellenic, and Human Rights Caucuses. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom has for three years straight placed Turkey on its watch list. In 2009, Bartholomew I, the ecumenical Christian Orthodox Patriarch of Constantinople appeared on CBS's 60 Minutes and reported that Turkey's Christians were second-class citizens and that he personally felt crucified by a state that wanted his church to die out. Church property is routinely confiscated through discriminatory laws. Uh, the United States Commission on Religious Freedom reported that over the previous five decades the Turkish state has, using convoluted regulations and undemocratic laws, confiscated hundreds of religious minority properties, primarily those belonging to the Greek Orthodox community, as well as the Armenian Orthodox, Catholics, and Jews. It is time to add the voice of the American Congress uh, in an effort to make sure that Turkey meets its international responsibilities. Gentleman from California, Mr. Royce. Reserve. Uh, I'll reserve the balance of my time to close. Gentleman from California reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Kentucky. I might just make one other comment about Turkey. We all know that with the Arab Spring and the movement toward more free governments in the Middle East, that Prime Minister Erdogan has been one of the real leaders. He has spoken up against Syria. He has spoken up against Egypt. He has spoken against um, Tunisia and other countries and has been a real leader in trying to bring about a measure of freedom in that area. I might also say that the time period that's been discussed earlier about the early 19th, the early 1900s, of course during World War I when a lot of these things took place, the country, the Ottoman Empire was fighting for its mere existence at that time. And there were a lot of atrocities that took place on both sides. But as I said, this resolution, there's certainly not anything in this resolution for anyone to oppose. But I think that we should recognize that Turkey is making great strides, that they are returning properties, that they are uh, 
taking a, a, a step, as has been pointed out by Secretary of State Clinton and as uh, by the religious watch organizations and others. Now, at this time, I'd be happy to yield. Uh, Mr. Berman had requested that I yield some time. I'd be happy to yield some time to uh, someone on that side if they would care to have it. Uh, well, if the gentleman would yield, I'd, I'd be very grateful if the gentleman would yield two minutes to my friend from New York, uh, 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 distinguished okay. member. I'd be of happy to Mr. yield Ringo. two minutes to the gentleman from New York. And from New York is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from California and also the gentleman from Kentucky uh, for, for yielding to me. Um, I, I rise in support of the resolution. Mr. Speaker, I've become increasingly concerned with the direction of Turkey in the past few years. It's elected an Islamist government which has pushed the country toward Iran and into conflict with Israel. While I'm relieved that Ankara is now taking a strong stand against the repression in Syria, finally, but much needs to change in Turkey. In particular, Turkey, which has such a profound connection with the birth and growth of Christianity, has today expropriated church properties, harassed worshipers, and refused to grant full legal status to some Christian groups. In fact, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom placed Turkey on its watch list for the third straight year and concluded that, quote, the Turkish government continues to impose serious limitations on freedom of religion or belief, thereby threatening the continued vitality and survival of religious communities in Turkey, unquote. I therefore rise in strong support of HRS 306, which urges Turkey to return stolen Christian churches to the Armenian, Greek, Assyrian, and Syriac communities and to end discrimination against surviving Christians. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky. Gentleman from Kentucky Reserve. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, maintain the balance of my time. Gentleman from Kentucky Reserve. Gentleman from California, Mr. Berman. Yes. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm pleased to yield uh, two and a half minutes to Chairman, co-chair of the Armenian Caucus, uh, uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for two, two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Berman. I'm proud to rise in support of House Resolution 306 urging the Republic of Turkey to safeguard its Christian heritage and to return confiscated church properties. As an original co-sponsor of this resolution, I believe that its adoption is critically important to showing that the U.S. Congress will not remain silent while countries such as Turkey violate basic religious freedoms. This resolution is needed because the sad reality is that minority religious communities in Turkey daily face oppressive policies propagated by the Turkish government. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom has found, and I quote, the Turkish government's formal long-standing efforts to control religion by imposing suffocating regulations and by denying full legal status to religious institutions results in serious religious freedom violations. And the Commission has recommended that the U.S. urge Turkey to comply with its international commitments regarding freedom of religion or belief, and that is exactly what this resolution does. Now, many within Turkey today and many more have fled religious persecution over the past century, knowing the frightening consequences that religious persecution has had on Christians and their churches. Each year, the Armenian Issues Caucus, which I co-chair, gathers to commemorate the Armenian Genocide. Over a million Armenians were killed in the genocide over 90 years ago. But Armenians in Turkey and their churches and landmarks and cemeteries continue to be targets for Turkish persecution. You know, I wanted to mention to my colleague, and I respect my colleague from Kentucky a great deal, the fact of the matter is that Turkey has never admitted that the genocide has occurred. And the fact that, you know, you mentioned that uh, in the World War I, well, there were problems on both sides, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is that over one million Armenians were massacred, um, and their churches and everything continue to be targets today. The resolution further calls on Turkey to stop its oppressive policies towards the education of Greek priests and its overt attempts to pressure the ecumenical patriarchate to leave his home country. Can you imagine that they're asking the patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church to leave Turkey, where he and the patriarchate have been for, I don't know, 2,000 years? So I really believe, if, if you believe that we should have freedom to practice your religion without, 
without interference of oppressive governments, uh, then you should really vote yes on this resolution. And, I, and the fact of the matter is that Turkey continues to do all these things. You know, the suggestion I know my colleague has made from Kentucky that somehow they're doing a better job. I mean, it's just very token, and there are just as many instances where they continue the oppression uh, that compared to those few where maybe they've tried. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield myself uh, the balance of the time allotted. The gentleman allotted from to me. California holds a minute and a half. Mr. Speaker, we want Turkey to follow through on its commitment to return confiscated property to Christian communities and to provide compensation for properties that can't be recovered. We want Christian communities in Turkey to enjoy the same rights and privileges that religious minorities enjoy in this country. We want Turkey to acknowledge the Armenian Genocide. This is not too much to ask. In fact, that is the minimum we must ask if Turkey is ever to join the ranks of the world's fully free nations. I commend my good friend and colleague, Mr. Royce, for introducing resolution, this resolution and working with me closely on this critical issue. And I urge all my colleagues to join me in supporting this resolution. The gentleman yield. yields back. Gentleman from Kentucky. I might also say that uh, in order to ensure the future viability of the Orthodox Church, the appointment of non-Turkish citizen metropolitans to the Patriarchate's Holy Synod have been explicitly permitted in Turkey since 2004. Furthermore, in 2010, Turkey offered citizenship to metropolitans of foreign nationalities who chose to apply. Additionally, issues regarding the residence permits of foreign clergy have been resolved. I might also point out that I would mentioned earlier that the, religious, the Directorate of Religious Affairs in Turkey had made available one of the religious scholars in Turkey to uh, conduct a seminar at Wesley Theological Seminary. I would also uh, mention to the body that the South Korean Methodist Church has been evangelizing in parts of Turkey, and they have a church in Antakya, which is one of the early Christian church sites uh, that's located in Turkey, one, one of many. And they have been practicing uh, their religion in Antakya. And so I would say that I don't want people to leave here with the impression that Turkey is out there deliberately trying to re deny religious freedom, because that simply uh, is not the case. Now, uh, they, maybe they have a, a, a way to go. But as I've said, there's certainly nothing in this resolution that refers to anything about a genocide. This is simply talking about religious freedom. And I wanted to simply point out the steps that Turkey has been taking and continue to take. And uh, with that, I would reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Kentucky reserves the balance of his time. Ge gentleman from California, Mr. Royce. Thank you. Uh, in closing, Mr. Speaker, religious freedom is a foundation necessary, I believe, for any democracy. It's a freedom we here in America can enjoy, and frankly, it's embodied, embedded so deeply in our culture that many of us tend to take these freedoms for granted. But unfortunately, this same scenario does not exist around this globe, and um, I just have to tell you, Turkey has been identified on the Religious Freedom Watch list for three straight years. I wish that weren't the case, but it is. And frankly, I believe that what progress has come comes at least in part, in part, due to this type of pressure from religious freedom reports or, or from resolutions. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom allows us to gather nonpartisan information on countries that violate these fundamental human rights. And it's my understanding that in 2008, the government of Turkey claimed they would return confiscated properties, but out of 1,400 claims, less than 100 were approved. Now, we have, we have close relations with Turkey, 
We have common interests, and this is a friendly urging that it do more on this important issue, and frankly, one that Turkey itself has committed to improving on. But that said, with some of the statements here made here today, I, I have to comment on an issue of which I have some personal knowledge or, or memory. When I was a young boy, I remember very well an Armenian in my community, a very elderly Armenian who was the sole Armenian in his village to survive the Armenian genocide. And the reason he survived was because one of his neighbors hid him. And he told me the story of the atrocities that occurred there. Now, for our ambassador, Henry Morgenthau, who, who detailed what was going on while he was ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, this was not something that happened in theory. It was a genocide that cost a million and a half human lives. And the fact that even today Turkey does not acknowledge the existence of that Armenian genocide in the Ottoman Empire, I think, should still give us pause. When we're dealing with the remnants of, that, of the population of what was once a sizable percentage of the population of that area, when we're dealing with the question of what remains, 1% uh, Greek and Armenian um, heritage and ethnicity, that remains in Turkey today. I think it is only proper that when we have this kind of report that comes back to us from the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and it details the fact that for three years running, rather than make progress, we've seen uh, backsliding, I think it is time for this body to take the position and send the message, return that confiscated property to its rightful owners. Allow those, that small minority that remains, that wants to practice their faith, allow them to practice their faith. Allow them to continue in their schools so that the next generation that wishes to follow in that tradition can do so. Uh, that's the request here. Gentlemen's time has expired. Gentlemen from California retains the right for final closing. Gentlemen from Kentucky. In conclusion, I would just say and reiterate once again that in the 13th annual report on international religious freedom, the U.S. Department of State also underscored Turkey's recent efforts. During the reporting period, the government took steps, important steps to improve religious freedom. These positive statements have replaced the status of no change in the situation regarding religious freedom uh, in Turkey. And with that, I would yield back the balance of my time. Yields back his time, gentlemen from California, is time has expired. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and agree to House Resolution 306 as amended? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the resolution is agreed to, and without objection, the motion is reconsidered and laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentleman rise? Mr. Speaker, I, I move that the House do now adjourn. The question is, on the motion to adjourn, those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion to adjourn is adopted. In accordance with the House standing adjournment in, uh, until 10 a.m. tomorrow for morning hour debate. House is adjourned. Earlier today in the House, members passed a bill that extends payroll tax cuts for one year and unemployment benefits for two years. The final vote was 234 to 193. The legislation also